for this chapter, it's important that you know the different types of tissues, where their locations are on the body, and what their major function is. So let's go over the four different types of tissues here. Uh, this first lecture is going to be on epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue is going to be thought of as the covering of the body. So it's going to be making up the skin. It's also going to be lining internal organs as well as blood, as well as blood vessels. Connective tissue, which is the most diverse of all the different types of tissues, is going to be thought of as support. And there are many different examples. The third type is going to be muscle, and there's only three types of muscle. But this one is going to be thought of as movement and contractility, as we would expect. And then the fourth one is the controlling tissue, which would be nervous tissue. So our next slide here is showing the four major types of tissue and where they're going to be located in the body. Nervous tissue, as I mentioned, is going to be for control. And you can see that it's going to be found in the brain, the spinal cord, as well as making up nerves. The muscle tissue is going to be contraction and movement. And there's three types of them. There's skeletal. There is cardiac, found in the heart. And there's also smooth muscle tissue. The first type that we're going to talk about in this chapter is epithelial tissue, and it has lots of different functions. It's lining the skin, so it makes up the epidermis. Uh, notice the dermis is actually connective tissue, not epithelial tissue. This is an important differentiation for you to know. And the epithelial tissue is, first of all, in responsible for protection, as in epidermis, secretion of substances into the GI tract, absorption, and also filtering, which is what happens predominantly in the kidneys. Then connective tissue, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is the most diverse of all the types that we have. And some examples of connective tissue are bone, osseous tissue, tendons, ligaments, blood is an example of connective tissue, as well as fat and other types of padding. So again, one example of connective tissue that it's important to differentiate is knowing that the dermis is one of the examples of connective tissue. So epithelium has some significant characteristics that you should be aware of. First of all, it is found covering and lining the surfaces. And so for this reason, we say that it has polarity. You were introduced to the, the term of polarity in chapter 2. Remember that water is an example of a polar covalent molecule. And so these specific cells, they have polarity. They have two different ends to them. They have an apical region, and they have a basal region. So there's a top and a bottom. The top region of the cell, which is usually going to be facing the inside of the digestive tract, for example, is the apical region, whereas the bottom is the basal region, and it's where we would find the basal lamina which is the layer that is underneath it. So the epiderm or the epithelium has many, many close packed cells. So they are formed very closely together. And tight junctions, for example, are closely tying them together when we think of the digestive system. Another important consideration or characteristic to be sure that you know is that they are avascular. And so this means without a blood supply. However, they are innervated, so there is a nerve supply. So we will see some small nerves that are throughout the epithelium. It has a high generation of re a high rate of regeneration, so there is constant mitosis. So our skin is constantly being replaced about once a month. And then when we consider the different examples of epithelial tissue, we see that it can be many layers or it can be one layer. If it's only one layer, it's called simple. If it's many layers, it's called stratified. One of the other important characteristics is that these cells will sometimes have what is called microvilli. You learned about microvilli in chapter 3, and microvilli 
are finger-like projections that are going to increase the surface area for absorption of the cell. So in this slide, we see an example of simple, which is only one layer thick. So simple epithelial is just one layer thick. And stratified would be many layers thick, as you can see here on this important diagram. The other classification that we use for epithelium is the shape of the cell. The squamous cells look like they are squashed. And when you look at a microscope view of them from the top, they almost look like scrambled eggs or lily pads, for example. Then there are also some that are square shaped, and these squares are cuboidal in shape. And the simple epithelial, um, there could be simple epithelium squamous, simple epithelial cuboidal. There can also be the column shaped ones, as we can see here. Now as far as their shape, their shape is very important for their function. The simple epithelia, only one layer thick, think about where they need to be in the body for the functions that they need to perform. So in a part of the body where absorption is going to occur, we would find simple epithelia. Where there is secretion that's going to occur, we would find simple, simple epithelia, as well as filtration. So where there needs to be some molecules that pass from the tissue into a um, organ. We find stratified epithelium in places of the body where there is lots of abrasion that could happen. So where there could be lots of cell loss. So the skin is going to be stratified epithelial, for example. Other examples of stratified epithelia could also be lining the mouth or lining the, um, the anus or the vagina, for example, or lining the inside of the urethra. So besides shape, um, we're now going to look at some specific examples. And these are going to be the most important thing to know for this unit. You have some the pictures similar to this in your textbook that show you the description of the cell its function and where it's going to be located at. So our first one is simple squamous epithelium. And in this case, the, um, it's almost going to look like a tiled floor, as you can see from this picture. The cells are going to be very, very thin, so it's going to be in a location of the body where diffusion of materials can happen. So one great example of this in the body is going to be lining the lungs. In the lungs, there's oxygen and carbon dioxide that need to pass across this membrane, so it can diffuse from high to low. Another important function of simple squamous epithelium is filtration. So in the kidney glomeruli is where we find filtration occurring. In the air sacs is where we find diffusion and lining the heart and blood vessels, we have special simple, simple squamous epithelium that has specific names to it. So for example, lining the cardiovascular system, remember from chapter one, that the cardiovascular system includes the heart and the blood vessels. And in this particular example, we see specific membranes that are called endothelium, which is simple squamous epithelium just in the cardiovascular system. There are also specific serosa membranes lining the ventral cavity, and these are called mesothelium. So again, it's just a specific name for a, a layer of simple squamous epithelium. Our next example of epithelium is called simple cuboidal epithelium. And in this case, we have secretion and absorption that can, can both occur. So Absorption would be when something passes, for example, from the kidney tubules into the tissues. And the opposite, the secretion, would be when molecules are going to pass from the tissues back into the kidney. So this arrow right here. So you need to know the location where you find simple cuboidal epithelium in the kidney tubules, as well as, as in certain ducts, which we'll talk about in the next mini lecture of glands and also on the ovary surface. Notice in this highlighted figure here that the simple cuboidal epithelial cell would 
um, have a nucleus that almost takes up the entire square-shaped cell. Our next example of epithelia is simple columnar epithelium. And you can see that these have very elongated cells. And a lot of times, these cells are going to bear cilia. They also may bear dense microvilli, which can increase the surface area. So for example, you may see some microvilli here. This microvilli is going to increase the surface area. I'm going to put SA for surface area. What we're looking at is the stomach mucosa. So this area where the arrow is would be the, um, the molecules in the stomach that we have just digested that now need to be absorbed. So when they're absorbed, they're going to pass in this direction. So there is the main function for simple columnar epithelium is absorption. And absorption um, is this direction of this arrow that you see here. Also, there could be some secretion of mucus enzymes. And there's also non-ciliated type, types, which are going to be in the digestive tract. So you see some examples right here. It's non-ciliated. Instead, it has micro villi, which increase the surface area. And there's some other examples that are shown in this figure on this slide. Our next example would be pseudostratified columnar epithelia. And pseudostratified columnar epithelia, uh, pseudo means fake. So it really looks like it's many layers, but it's truly not. And so if you look closely, um, there's only one nucleus per cell here. It's just that the nuclei are at different levels. So in lab, you may have to identify some pictures of these. Uh, you won't have to do that in lecture, for the lecture test. You have to know for lecture their functions and their locations throughout the body. But in this case, there are cilia. And cilia are constantly being, they're constantly moving, so they're motile. And a great example of this would be in the trachea. The cilia is going to be moving in a su superior direction to flush out dust or to, to get rid of dust and particles that would be deeper in the lungs so that doesn't reach the depths of our lungs. So it helps to protect us. The other important characteristic that you see in pseudostratified columnar epithelia is you will see the presence of goblet cells. And this would be a goblet cell. A goblet cell is named because it kind of looks like a wine goblet. And a goblet cell is a unicellular cell that secretes mucus. And so this is really, really important in our in the trachea because it also helps to kind of trap the bacteria and helps us to form sputum that we can either spit it out or we can swallow it. So these are all the examples of simple epithelia because they're only one layer. Even pseudostratified columnar epithelium is an example of simple because, again, it's only one layer. Our next type of epithelium is called stratified squamous epithelia. And this is the most widespread of the stratified epithelia. It has several layers, as you can see from this slide. And one of the important characteristics is the deepest layer is going to be constantly dividing. So the basal layer here is, in fact, dividing. So it's actively undergoing mitosis. And this example that we have here is in the esophagus, uh, which is going to be an example of non-keratinized. Keratin is a tough protein that's important for protection. We're going to talk about it in the next unit, as it's very important for the integumentary system. But uh, the large majority of stratified squamous is keratinized. And um, again, the non-keratinized would be in some of these other examples that you have in here. So one of the big things that you need to know for your test is the various location where we find these different types of cells. So kind of use these, these slides as flashcards to study from. The next slide is showing transitional epithelium. You're not going to be responsible for stratified cuboidal epithelium. And stratified columnar epithelium is there's not very many examples of this in the body. Transitional epithelium means that it actually transitions or changes 
from a more uh, stratified to a more columnar looking cell. So if we look at these cells at the apical surface, they look quite differently than the ones that are at the basement surface here. Uh, for example, the ones in the middle look more cuboidal, and some of them at the top look more squamous, and some may look more, um, more columnar in their appearance. But these are going to be, the transition epithelium is going to be found in parts of the body that stretches very easily and where some uh, fluid has to be stored. So the urinary system is the best example of where we find transitional epithelium. So the cells actually will stretch and they will look differently when they are stretched than when the organ is not stretched.